Hi Macquarie, welcome to our online service. What a crazy time to be alive and living in this world. So much to be thankful for, but so much to pray for. We are all hearing these radical stories coming from the floods up north and out of the Ukraine. So let's join together in prayer and believe the God of the universe, whose earth is his footstool, will redeem, bring hope and bring justice. Join with me now as we pray. Father, we just lift up all these needs. We thank you that you are the God of the universe, that you have predestined, you have planned. And Holy Spirit, right now we join with our Ukrainian brothers and sisters and ask that um, you would just provide, you would, you would uh, speak, and that Holy Spirit, you would also just comfort in this time. We ask for justice to be done too, Lord. We also just lift up all our people, all our Aussie fellow friends and family members up north, we just declare, God, that you will just come into the come into this space, come into this place where the floods have destroyed. That Holy Spirit will hear stories of life, stories of restoration, and stories of hope in your mighty name. Amen. Don't forget to follow our social media pages to keep up to date with church events and see the amazing connections that are happening in our church community. Following worship, we have the incredible Mark McLennan sharing with us today. He will be continuing our series on the anatomy of faith. And I can't wait to hear the word this morning and hear Mark's bold message of faith. So join us now as we worship.
just, church, I kept thinking when we were singing that song, Let the Ruins Come to Life, I just kept seeing the kids in, U- in Ukraine in the bomb shelters and so much ruin. So, Father, from the other side of the world, we lift up those ones, that nation. And, Father, I pray that those ruins would come to life. Father, that there would be beauty from the ashes. Put your hand over that nation, protect that nation. Walk by your Holy Spirit into all of those bomb shelters, all those places where they're hiding, Father, and bring them comfort, Father. We praying for them, Father, by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And lastly, I know I'm doing lots of praying. I want to pray for the prodigals, that beautiful song, This Is Our Homecoming. You know, Dan said this incredible thing this morning. Don't miss what Dan said. You know, actually evangelism now flows on a relationship stream. Who have you got in your life that the Holy Spirit's already working on? Don't invite, I, well, I'm not going to invite people over that, are, that aren't ready, but invite people over the Holy Spirit's already working in their life. He's gone before. Now last Yesterday, I asked my friend for a walk. The Holy Spirit's already working in her life, and I didn't do a dinner, Dan, but I did the best carrot cake, I reckon, in Australia. (laughs) And uh, at the end, I just said, can I pray for you? And she said, Ros, I would love that. We talked a lot, so I prayed for different things. So, Father, I pray for this strategy. It's part of... us being mobilised, the prodigals, the ones we have in our lives, the becks in our lives. Holy Spirit, you're already working on them. One in four, Holy Spirit, you are already working on. The parable of the sower shows that. Prepare them and prepare us not to be chicken, but to be brave and to be bold, to put our egos aside, Father, because, Father, this world needs you your hope in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Grab a seat. No one is flooding or you're all going okay. All right. I just wanted to um, introduce our preacher. Before I do that, I just want to let you know that on Vision Sunday, you remember if you're here, I told you that we had consultants coming in to walk with us in this new season. So that has happened. The board and I are processing a few things and then I'm going to give you an update, all right? I don't want to give you a premature update, so just let me process a few things and then I will be letting you know where we're up to with that. All right, it was my privilege to introduce our preacher this morning who apparently fell off a ladder, but you can tell him that story (coughs) yourself. Mark McLennan, he's been married to Sue for 40 years, father to four beautiful girls and eight grandkids, started out as a mechanical engineer in, in BHP. I, this is the thing I was so impressed with. Became the first male home economics teacher in the state. Put your hand up if you did home economics. Yeah, I did too. That's why I make such a good carrot cake. <laughs> Then he became a pastor. So you're a true millennial. You change careers every five years. He loves to build things. He marries and buries people, if you want to get married or buried. And he loves getting off the grid with Sue. But he's genuine. He's warm. He walks with joy, wisdom, and a deep trust in God. But I have asked his daughter here to actually give him a bit of an intro because there's nothing like a generational a daughter. We don't often have that. Thank you, Sarah. No worries. I love my dad. He's the, he is the funnest and the realest um, person. Like He's one of my favourite people. You know what I really like is that as I um, grew up and became an adult and did the thing that every person has to do and you realise that your parents are not these... Uh, uh, holy figures or like absolutely infallible but um, you realise they're a real person and I actually really like who my dad is so he, I consider him one of my closest friends which I just think is so cool um, so I really love that and I just thought uh, the, the least spiritual thing I can add but one thing you might not know about my dad is that both he and I fancy ourselves uh, a bit of a aficionados on apples um, so we like to <laughs> 
establish a ranking, uh, a hierarchy of apples in the world. So just be careful if you start a conversation with Dad about apples because we can get very upset about the worst apples in the world, which we know are Red Delicious and Granny Smith apples. <laughs> this is my dad, Mark McLennan. <laughs> Yeah, way to start. Thanks for that, Sarah. Um, so, yeah, I may be a little unsteady on my legs today. On Friday, um, working at a little bit of height on very unstable ground due to water, that is, the ladder decided to leave the site and I came down on my back from two metres up and so a little bit sore. But uh, how good was that song and how good is it for me to be able to come and have my wife and my daughter on stage. That was really good, yeah. It's great to be here this morning and it's great to welcome those who may be online watching with us this morning in your Ugg boots with your blanket on. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. But I'm excited to be able to share with you as we continue to take a little bit of a deep dive into the anatomy of our faith. I find it interesting at this stage of life that, as Roz mentioned, um, virtually every week I get a call from France family funerals to whenever there's a non-religious funeral that they need conducted, they call me and I have the opportunity to sit with families in the messiness and the, the grief that they're going through and to create a celebration of life without a faith component. And a small part of that process that I use is to just ask the question, okay, I recognise that this is a non-religious funeral, but I'm wondering, was there ever a faith journey for Max or for Jen? Or... And, you know, usually oh, I don't have to scratch the surface very far to see that Max went to Sunday school when he was little. Yeah, and he went on to youth group and right through to his teens and... Jean's mum really wanted her to have some foundational aspects of who God is and the, and the greater things of life. But then in most cases, the story will go on to something happened. And usually, it's about people. And usually, faith is gone. Our faith can be so fragile, can't it? Uh, so taking a bit of a deep dive at this time into our faith and learning some things to reinforce that faith is probably a good thing. I think my ladder sinking on soft ground is quite metaphorical for where we're at today. To give you some context into the passages that we've been looking at in Hebrews, in Hebrews, Paul's writing to this small band of new Christians, and they are struggling through so much persecution, and they're feeling pretty isolated and alone in the process. In verses 7 to 12 of this 11th chapter, he reminds them of three greats, Noah, Abraham, and Sarah. Great examples of faith in history who were able to face every type of challenge that came before them and hardship because they had this solid faith. And he was encouraging them in this letter to hang in there, guys. Don't let go because you're not alone in the process. Dan was saying earlier, it's, it's not easy being a Christian today. Even talking about your faith can be pretty challenging socially. Friends often struggle to relate. Family look at you like you've been hijacked by some cult. And these days it's pretty much even politically incorrect to even suggest that there is only one way to heaven. <laughs> but what has helped God's people to deal with discouragement right through from the beginning is the knowledge that we are not alone. We follow in the footsteps of people from the earliest biblical times who were were unsure of what their futures held, but they chose to follow God anyhow. So let's have a look at these three examples in a little bit more depth. From verse 7, By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. So the story of Noah is found in Genesis uh, 6 verse 8. Most people would know about Noah and his boat. And the flood. But the real buzz about Noah isn't the flood or his boat. It's about his faith and his obedience to God's voice way before there was any water falling. 
So let's imagine God spoke to you these days and he said, I want you to spend the next 125 years of your life building a boat. Bigger than a footy field. So that in, two th- in the year 2147, you can save your family from a worldwide catastrophe. I think most of us would have a hard time following God in that. Although, with the amount of rain that we've been having over the last weeks, it's probably getting a bit easier. But what does Noah do? It goes on. Even though he was warned about events not yet seen, in holy fear he constructed an ark. Noah's attitude was, if God's saying it, even though it doesn't make any sense to me, I'm willing to believe it's true. People are going to laugh at me for 125 years. People are going to call me the village goose. My kids are going to be ostracised and laughed at at school. I'm going to lose my friends over this. But I fear God more than losing my friends. So even though he had no idea of what a worldwide flood even looked at, or as some scholars suggest, rain even looked like, he obeyed even when it didn't make sense. Church, that's what faith looks like in real life. Obeying God's word even when it makes absolutely no sense. Think about those times in your life when you have had to decide to follow what you believe God is leading you towards or leading you away from. Even though you can't see it, how it's going to pan out. Retrospect is always a great way of confirming our choices and our faith, isn't it? It's easy to, once you get to the other side to look back. But faith means even when I am in the dark about how God's going to work possibly in this situation, I will obey him and trust what he says is right. Even when it takes a long time sometimes for God to prove himself right. I look back over the years and... I wouldn't say that God's ever spoken to me personally, specifically. But now I can see those times when when God has so often, and let me tell you, sometimes it's not so subtle. He's closed doors and he's opened doors. He's never pushed me through any one of those doors. And I think I was fortunate to realise at a fairly young point in my life to be able to trust that God has things in control. And all I have to do is take those first steps to remain open to his directing. When our first daughter, Sean, who is unfortunately for her camping this weekend, (laughs) contracted meningitis at three days old, our first daughter, she had a stroke at four days old with a huge bleed on her brain. Left her paralysed down her right side and we were told as parents, new parents, don't expect much. And within an hour, our elders and our friends were around our bedside praying with us and for Sean. I know that's when my faith really took root. And I took my first step on God's prompting. See, we just, we just knew that regardless of what the doctors said and what the outcome was ultimately going to be, he had this. So we did everything the doctors told us to do and we did 20 minutes of physiotherapy, every nappy change, day and night for two years on her right side of her body. And we were unsure, but... We had peace about the process. And I look at her now. Don't expect too much. Wow. Oh, my goodness. I just marvel at the plan that God had over her life way back then. Paul then goes on to remind them of Abraham in Hebrews 11.8. He says, By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though... He didn't know where he was going. Abraham is like the supreme example of faith in the Bible. I mean, when you have been dead for 4,000 years and 3 billion Christians, Jews and Muslims still revere you, 
you're a pretty great man. Let me quickly review the story from Genesis 12. Abraham lived in the ancient city of Ur, which was like the Sydney of today, I guess. Uh, One day God spoke to him and said, Abraham, I want to give you a command and I want to give you a promise. The command was to leave his hometown, set off on a journey, but God didn't tell him where he was going. The promise was that God would bless him. Give him land to call his own and give him descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. So Abraham left like Noah. He obeyed God even when it didn't make any sense. But for Abraham, faith didn't just involve obeying God. It also involved waiting on God when it appeared that God was pretty much offline. Hebrews 11, 9 to 19, 9 to 10, I should say. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundation whose architect and builder is God. Abraham got to the promised land. He lived there for decades in a tent. Even though God promised him it would all be his, nothing happened. But he kept looking forward. He realised the goal in life wasn't just to have everything perfect now. The goal was to simply trust that what God was saying, he would make it happen. Whenever and however he chose to do it. And so Abraham lived in a tent. Church, (laughs) we need to understand that every good thing that God gives us in this life is like a tent. It's temporary. Two weeks after we returned from our honeymoon, my wife Sue was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. Bait and switch, I always thought it was. (laughs) Over the years, her Crohn's has caused her a lot of disruption and pain. Now, back 20 years ago, she was booked in to have her second bowel resection. Uh, And at our home group the week before her operation, we decided we just wanted to pray over her, anoint her with oil and ask for healing. So she had a pre-op scan two days later, prior to her operation. There was no sign of Crohn's disease. And the doctors, frustrated that he had an op booked, He certainly would not believe that it was a miracle when we told him what we'd done. But he cancelled the op, and our faith component shot up. Sue enjoyed 10 years of absolutely no issues with Crohn's disease. Then it came back. What do you do with that? Well, We don't understand why, but we still have faith that God has a plan because when you're living life in the understanding that whatever happens, it's part of God's plan and God has got it, things no longer need to make sense, nor do they even seem to need fair, seem fair. What I do know is that during that 10 years, Sue took the gift of healing that had been given to her as the gift it was. When it came back, she remembered that she had been given that gift of 10 years and she chose to continue to be thankful. It didn't damage her faith. It didn't cause her doubt. She chose to understand that all things in this life are temporary. Something else I think we need to notice here is that not all of God's plans are completed in our lifetime. Even though we usually think that whatever God is doing at any set time is pretty much based on us. In fact, a lot of times what God is up to is only using us as one very small link in a chain of something much greater than us. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, three generations of people in the promised land. Three generations of waiting for God to keep his promise. They eventually had to leave and go to Egypt for food to survive. After Abraham dies, 
For 400 years they're in Egypt. They multiply like rabbits and eventually Moses brings them back. Whole other story. But I get this image of Abraham being in heaven. Oh, God, of course, of course. You kept your promise even better than I could have imagined. But see, he was only the first link in the chain of what God had planned. Church, I think we need that faith perspective. That we may only be one link in what God is doing. What God is doing here. Mark and Roz may be only one link. They are fairly significant links. But, but be excited about the links to come. A new season that we keep talking about. And we might die and never comprehend what fully God was doing here until we finally view it from the vantage point of eternity. See, God's plans are often much longer term than we would like them to be. Our job is to live by faith and trust God. Which brings us to our third example in the passage in Hebrews 11, 11 to 12. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing years, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful, who had made the promises. And so from this one man, and he was as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. (laughs) God promised Abraham that from him a nation would come. And Abraham was excited, like, let's do this. But it didn't start. In fact, Abraham and Sarah blew way past the years where they should have been bearing children. I love how the writer puts it when he says that Sarah was worn out and Abraham was as good as dead. (laughs) But they considered him faithful who had made the promise. There's a few things that tells us about faith, you know. Firstly, faith means we believe God will keep his promise, even though it seems way late in coming. Faith believes God is reliable and keep his word, and that it will be in his time, not ours. Faith will have many times where God just seems to be leaving us in the dark about whatever it is that he's doing. Doesn't it seem like God leaves us in the dark a lot? I know there are times even now when I have real calendar issues with God. Like when you think something should be happening in your life and it isn't. Do you have those? Maybe like Abraham, you think God should have been giving you children by now, but he hasn't. Perhaps you're praying for the heart of a child to turn back to God. And it hasn't. Maybe you're unemployed and you're frustrated with God and you're thinking, God, why are you keeping me down? And maybe you're angry at God because you're sick and it just keeps going on and on. God hasn't made you well. God, I have asked you so many times to to heal me and make me healthy so that I can do all of this for you. But it's like you aren't listening. What do we do with our calendar dates? Well, I believe that we are encouraged in faith to wait on God to fulfill the desires, our desires in his time. He may fulfill them in this life. Or like Abraham, he may make us wait a really long time. But when it does happen, there will be no question that it was him who did it. The reason God made Abraham and Sarah wait until they were as good as dead before he gave them a child wasn't to destroy their faith. It was to grow their faith. He was making them spiritually ready to receive what he had determined he was going to do all along. Can you imagine how strong their faith was after their first son Isaac was born? Can you imagine how many times sitting at the dinner table they talked about that? Mum was ancient and Dad, I don't even know how. 
Can you imagine the spiritual foundation that this would have given Isaac when later on he had calendar issues with God in his life? I can't even remember where I heard it, but I love the idea that faith is better caught than taught. See, I think it's impossible to teach faith or to read about it or to listen to a message about it or to just be told that you need to have it and then have it. We need to live it out. We need to put it on. We need to walk around with it in our life and have it tested by things that are going to make us recognise just how significant it is in our life. I really appreciate the way Richard Rohr, who is one of my favourite contemporary theologians, he manages to phrase things just beautifully and he has this great quote when he's talking about faith. He says, We don't think ourselves into new ways of living. We live ourselves into new ways of thinking. Isn't that great? Now you would think a good way to live out your faith would be to surround yourself by people who exhibit a life of faith and walk with them, which is pretty much what I think Sue and I did most, most of the way through our lives. But as I sat down to prepare this message, I started looking back at my spiritual heroes that I've walked with at different times through the years who have sown into my life and helped me to grow spiritually, who have helped me to pastor a church and work with me in ministries, whose teaching I have sat under and learned from. And I realised something really concerning. Many of them now are just a mess. Broken marriages, weird or no faith journey. Walking away from not only the church, but from God. And I began to understand why Paul is encouraging us here to remember Noah and Abraham and Sarah. Because it reminds us that our faith cannot be built on people. On how educated their teaching sounds. Or how well they know their Bible. Or how well they can run a ministry. Our faith can't be sustained by people. Because they will constantly and they will spectacularly fail, often. People will do what people do. Whether it's let you down, deceive, gossip, break trust, discriminate, hurt or leave you. And when that happens, particularly in the church, so often we take our, well, if that's what Christians are like, I want nothing to do with them. And we discard our faith. Our faith is in God through Jesus. Who in the very next chapter of Hebrews is described as the author and perfecter of our faith. And we're going to hear a lot more about that later on. As I look back at the mess my spiritual heroes have made in their lives... What it does is it makes me even more determined to finish the race strong... I want to finish with this. My mate Stewie Tabret, who's here at church, owns a business and he installs a thing called helical piers. These large screw piles act as foundations in places where the ground is unstable or muddy or sandy. And he twists those piles down at great force, often down around 15 metres until they hit something solid. And then those piers become solid foundations from which to build. And I think that often we don't really know who our faith is in. Because we haven't taken the time to find out who he really is. Which leaves our faith hanging on fairly shaky foundations. Unstable and likely to drop at any time. When the slightest load comes on it. Like Stewie's peers, we've got to find a way for our faith to be established on bedrock. Or as Paul puts it, foundations whose architect and builder are God. And if we manage to do that, I can tell you, and I can tell you it because I've lived it, that foundation will not let you down. 
and it will not get wa- give way when even the most significant pressures come on your life. Anne Lamott makes this great pr- comment as I finish off. In her book, Plan B, Further Thoughts on Faith. The opposition of faith is not doubt, but certainty. And certainty is missing the point entirely. Faith includes noticing the mess, the emptiness and the discomfort, and letting it be there until some light returns. Faith isn't a perfect life and getting everything that I ask for. Faith is seeing the mess and then either seeing God at work in amongst it, repairing it, or trusting that God is working on it even though I can't see it. And let me tell you, that's a whole lot harder to do than believing with proof and certainty. It's easier to say, I don't believe because I don't see, or I don't believe because I'm not certain. But that's not what we're asked to do. (laughs) We're asked to believe despite our certainty. With all our doubts and our struggles and our questions all mixed in together. Into the hope, our hope of the way things are. Perhaps it's no wonder that so many people walk away. Sometimes people think that we shouldn't struggle with our faith. That we shouldn't have days where God seems really far away or out of touch. But I do. I think we all do. So when you feel that way and you just aren't sure, know that it is completely fine. But remember who your faith is focused on. Remember the bedrock upon which your faith sits. Know his attributes. Know his promises that he has made to you so clearly through his word. Remember his goodness to you in the past and know that you're not alone. Faith and doubt go side by side. Faith is not being certain. It's trusting in the midst of great uncertainty. Or as Richard Rohr puts it, faith alone holds you while you stand, waiting, hoping, and trusting. I'm not going to say it's an easy thing, but faith asks us to trust, to believe that we are loved and that we are not alone. Thank you. How good was that? Definitely got some faith anatomy to dissect and work on this coming week. Just a reminder around our giving. It is online, so head to our website to check out the giving options. It takes faith to give. And the Bible says it is more blessed to give than receive. We all love receiving. Who doesn't? But receiving doesn't require much faith. Giving does. And so giving activates faith, which can activate blessing in your world. Hey church, are you ready to roll the sleeves up? Our church working bee is taking place on Saturday, March 19th, 8 to 11 a.m. Many hands on deck would be highly appreciated. From our carpets out to our car park. Let's do this. Let me ask you a question now. Have you noticed the culture around us is becoming more actively hostile towards Christian beliefs and values? We need to find new and compelling ways to share the gospel in this generation. Jesus was constantly giving us whys and whys we need to reach out to people. However, he didn't always give us the how. And we can see the how though was modeled through his life and the way he acted. And so one of his hows was hospitality, sitting around the dinner table talking with people. So this Easter, we're inviting all of you to host a dinner party or a breakfast or whatever will work for you, for a neighbor, a friend, might even be the postman. But we would love you to register your dinner party online so we as a church can be praying for it. At your dinner party, 
We then want you to say grace and ask them a question. Can I pray for you? And if they're open and willing, fantastic. Ask them then if our church can even pray for them. You might even sense they are open to coming to one of our Easter services and so you might invite them along. So start thinking about who you can invite to your own Easter dinner party. Really appreciate you joining us online. Next week, Mark Zare will be sharing. So have a fantastic and blessed week, church. We love you.